The Farm to School Program Work Team is uh, supported through Cornell Cooperative Extension, and many of you are members. We have about 150 members. Cheryl, if you want to go to the next slide, there we go. Um, and it is just any stakeholder who's working on farm to school throughout the state is welcome to join. We have a lot of uh, farm to school coordinators and food service staff and farmers um, and nonprofits. And with all of you, we have a very robust listserv where you can ask questions and get answers and um, receive timely information about farm to school. And we also do these webinars. And if you guys think of any topics that you'd really like us to tackle in a future webinar, please put that in the chat as well. Um, and we have finally revamped our Farm to School website, which is uh, hyperlinked here. And you'll be able to get that when you get the information, uh, the recording and all that. And it's hosted on Cornell Cal's website. We're very excited about that. It's a great repository of, of lots of the great work and resources that are needed for Farm to School in New York State. So definitely check that out. Um, and we also do research and um, hopefully we'll be getting a statewide conference together and, and various collaborations. So if you're interested and you haven't joined the New York State Farm School Program Work Team, uh, there is a link on our new website. You can check it out and uh, we'll get you joined up. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Cheryl, who's going to um, tell you about our topic today and the other presenters. Take it away, Cheryl. Super, thanks so much, Mel. Next, we're gonna jump right in and talk about the topic at hand, which is the 30% New York State Initiative, Opportunities, Barriers, and Pathways to Success. This is your list of presenters today. I'm Cheryl Belinsky with Cornell Cooperative Extension Harvest New York. I serve a dual role for Extension, first as an Agricultural Economic Development Specialist for the state, and second as the Regional Farm to School Program Lead. I'm happy to be joined by my two colleagues, Cassandra Bull, who is a Farm to School Coordinator with Cornell Cooperative Extension of Allegheny County, and Becky O'Connor, who is a Farm to Institution Coordinator also with Cornell Cooperative Extension Harvest New York. Here's our agenda for the webinar. First, we'll start with acknowledgments. Next, we'll cover an introduction of the study, followed by an overview of the 57 school food authorities that were successful in reaching the 30% New York initiative in the 1920 school year. We'll then spend the bulk of the presentation discussing, discussing our results, share some relevant resources with all of you, and wrap it up with dedicated time for questions and answers. Please do drop your questions in the chat box when they arise. If they're pertinent to the topic under discussion, we will answer them on the fly. If not, we'll reserve them until the end. Now I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Becky, to take us through the introduction. Thanks, Cheryl. So let's jump right into the research. So when we set out to do this research, we had three main goals in mind. We wanted to debunk myths about the 30% New York initiative, which might preclude some SFAs from trying to achieve it. We wanted to assess the impact of the initiative on various sectors of the food system. And we wanted to highlight pathways to achieving 30% local procurement, because as you'll see, no two SFAs took the exact same approach. Next slide, please. To do this, we collected procurement data from successful SFAs. To apply for additional reimbursement, SFAs were required to submit an application attachment which itemized their purchases. 53 of the 57 successful SFAs provided this information. We got information on CEP status, which is community eligibility provision, district enrollment, average daily participation, dollar spent on New York food items, total cost for lunch, and percent of New York State products purchased from the New York State Department of Education's public reports portal for child nutrition reports listings. And finally, we conducted an online survey to gather information directly from food service directors to supplement the procurement data. The surveys, as you will see, helped flush out each, direct, each director's approach. Next slide, please. Just a few limitations and acknowledgements. First off, we want to thank the food service directors for providing procurement data and completing the survey. And we also want to thank the New York State Department of Education for helping us to interpret this data. For the survey, food service directors reported in the aggregate for all of the school food authorities and districts that fell under their management, not for each component school food authority. BOCES often manages several school food authorities, so this is important to note. 
There are several management structures at play which impact things like procurement power, menu planning, and the bid process. A school food authority is the administrating unit of operation of a school feeding program, and it receives federal meal reimbursement. We also call school food authorities SFAs throughout this, so you'll see that. An SFA can include one or multiple districts that are overseen by a food service director. Then we also have BOCES, which provides a variety of services. For this research, we want to highlight that two of the BOCES included oversee individual school food authorities. Um, they provide training, management, procurement services, et cetera, while the third BOCES serves as an actual school food authority for a number of districts. Also, not all SFAs itemized their purchases to a product-specific level. When the level of detail was insufficient, their data was excluded from the reporting. You can see here the total amount these SFAs reported in the aggregate rather than itemizing. And finally, some SFAs stopped reporting local purchases after reaching the 30% threshold. So the reported number of New York purchases is underrepresented. Next slide, please. So what is the 30% New York initiative? In 2018, Governor Andrew Cuomo launched the No Student Goes Hungry initiative, which is a larger initiative the 30% falls under. Through the 30% initiative, any SFA that can demonstrate using at least 30% of their food costs for lunch to purchase New York food products will receive 25 cents per meal in reimbursement from New York State. This is a 19 cent per meal increase over the current rate of 5.6 cents per meal in a non-COVID school year. So what is a New York food product? Uh, New York food products are any food items that are grown, harvested, or produced in New York State, or food items that are processed inside or outside of New York State that comprise over 51% New York agricultural raw materials grown, harvested, or produced in New York State by weight or volume. And now I'm going to hand it over to Cassandra. Thank you, Becky. First, I wanted to give an overview of the characteristics and themes of the 57 successful SFAs in school year 2019-2020. Information gleaned for this portion of the presentation comes from publicly available sources like New York State Education Department's data portal or the National Center for Education Statistics website. Next slide, please. First, we looked at the geographic distribution of SFAs. We found over a third of the counties in New York State had an SFA that qualified for the initiative. The map shows the regions most represented were Western New York and the Southern Tier, followed by the Central New York or Hudson Valley region and sprinkled among the capital region. The North Country, Hudson Valley, Long Island, and New York City regions were not among qualifying applicants. We also included support personnel, whether that be a coordinator or another person who assists SFAs with local purchasing. The green dots do not represent all support personnel in the entire state, but do represent the personnel associated with each qualifying SFA. Next slide, please. Next, we wanted to see where the most purchases were. These regions on the map are what New York State Economic Development Council uses as well as the Department of Ag and Markets when making geographic preference decisions on farm to school grant applications. The most purchases were made in the Western New York region at $2.8 million, followed by the Southern Tier region at 1.9 million. This totaled over $5 million for year two of the initiative. I wanna be explicit that these purchases were not the only purchases of local products in New York State. Plenty of SFAs are currently purchasing local food and it's just not being tracked or shared in an aggregated or cohesive manner. SFA spent anywhere from $7,000 on New York foods in one year to over $2 million, like in Buffalo City School District. But in general, most SFAs were smaller and had total school lunch budgets of less than $125,000. Next slide, please. In total, 
The New York 30% initiative impacted 145,000 students with about 60% of them actively eating school lunch each day. The map on this slide shows how many students were enrolled in qualifying SFAs by county. One of the myths we talked about before was that we heard schools saying they either could or could not qualify because they were too big or too small. So the range of student enrollment K through 12 was from 183 to nearly 40,000 students, like in Buffalo City School District. The median was 1,100 students fully enrolled. And with 95% of SFAs having student enrollment of less than 6,000, we saw smaller schools were more represented among qualifying applicants than larger schools. Next slide, please. We've also heard a common sentiment about the community eligibility provision, which is a program that gives SFAs with higher percent free and reduced student populations the opportunity to offer free meals to all students. The sentiment was that CEP schools couldn't qualify for the program. Uh, on the contrary, we heard that the program was unfairly biased to support CEP schools. What we actually found is that the SFAs were evenly split among schools that were, were not, or had a mix of schools under the community eligibility provision. When looking at income, we found that almost half of districts faced more poverty and served students receiving SNAP than the state average. Next slide, please. Lastly, we looked at demographic diversity. We wanted to see who the New York 30% initiative was supporting. We use quite a few of these style charts in the report, uh, but each horizontal bar here represents one district's demographic makeup. And as you can see, 83% of districts had a student population that was over 90% white. Next slide, please. But when we look at the aggregated population of the students that were served by the SFAs qualifying for the New York 30% initiative, we see that there is more diversity. This is because schools served by Broom Tioga BOCES, Oneida Herkimer Madison BOCES, and Buffalo City School District had more students of color and were larger in size than smaller, whiter, often more rural districts. Overall, the initiative did not serve a representative number of New York students. We note that this is because schools downstate or in the New York City metropolitan region did not qualify and tend to have more students of color than in upstate New York. Next, I'm going to pass it along to Cheryl to talk about our results. Great, thanks so much, Cassandra. In this next block, I'm going to share some high-level observations, after which we'll dig into the product category detail in greater depth. This slide presents four unique pathways individual SFAs took to achieve the 30%. As illustrated in these charts, there is no one-size-fits-all approach. Before diving in, I'll just acknowledge the prominent role dairy played in every pathway as depicted by the blue part of the wheel. The value of dairy to the 30% is a major finding threaded throughout this presentation and the forthcoming report, though it really came as no surprise. In the first chart, we see a high percentage of fruit, a bit of protein, and only a tiny sliver allocated to vegetables. Example two highlights a school food authority that purchased a large amount of protein at 33.4% of their total spend. When compared to the other three, it proves to be a significant difference. Example three is dairy heavy with 82.3% of this SFA's 30% spend directed to dairy purchases and leaving only 3.2% accounted for by proteins, vegetables, and other New York items. Obviously fruit played a significant role in this pathway as well. Lastly, example four demonstrates a school food authority that directed over 40% of their 30% spend to New York fruits and vegetables. Again, a considerable variance from the other three examples. To reiterate, there are multiple different pathways to the 30%, which we'll further unpack in subsequent slides. We asked food service directors which procurement methods were used to purchase New York food products. Not surprisingly, food service directors cited the use of many different tools, but micro-purchase stood out as the most used method with 71% of food service directors citing the use of it. 
When drilled down, 31% of food service directors said it was the most helpful tool to achieving the 30%. The second most used method was small purchase with 59% of directors citing the use of it. Of interest, 47% of food service directors noted they aggregated orders with neighboring school food authorities to reach order minimums. We'll be highlighting the use of aggregating orders in the full report and how specifically regions use this tool and what items they procured with it. Important to note that issued an RFI, which is a request for information, was not an option provided to all. It was a write-in, so it's unknown if others used that tool and if so, found it to be helpful. Lastly, all but one FSD cited that they used multiple procurement methods to purchase local foods, with 35% using two methods, 24% using three, and 18% using four and five methods. This is an overview of total 30% purchases broken down by product category, showing total dollars spent, the median, range, and standard deviation, and the most purchased item within each category. We are going to dig into all of this categorial data in subsequent slides, so I won't spend too much time now, but the intention of this slide is to once again illustrate the dramatic range of purchases by category and indirectly the multiple pathways to 30% success. Take a look at dairy. The contribution of dairy products to the 30% spans from 25.3% to 82.3%. Similarly, with the exception of vegetables, the range of purchases for every other category starts at 0%, meaning that at least one school food authority purchased no qualifying fruit, protein, grain, or other items, yet still achieved the 30%. Lastly, you'll note the most purchased item within each category, which we'll unpack in a bit more detail in just a moment. Here we see the average percentage of New York purchases by category. Dairy, not surprisingly, comprises the largest chunk and fruit, the second largest. Here we actually see the products overall that were the most frequently purchased items across all SFAs. Milk takes the lion's share of the pie with $2.3 million of the total $5.1 million spent on it alone. If you recall in the former slide, fruit accounted for an average of 17.9% of total New York food purchases Grape and apple products accounted for the majority of these purchases, as you see here. Lastly, I'll just point out that two animal-based proteins made it in the top 10 list, and they were comprised of beef, something we'll expand upon later. In this slide, we look at purchases by process type, contrasting those purchases that were directed to fresh, raw, and or minimally processed foods versus processed foods. As you may recall from the limitation slide, some school food authorities didn't provide subcategorial data, which is what the non-itematized gray blocks speak to. For example, they lumped all fruit together and we had no way of knowing what was processed versus unprocessed. We were interested in seeing the breakdown of processed versus fresh, raw, and minimally processed products by product category to see where the dollars were being spent specifically with regard to fruits and vegetables, as many of the other products must be processed from their raw state to be consumed. Focusing in on vegetables, the majority of the items that were purchased were minimally processed, fresh, and or raw. The orange sliver is solely attributed to the purchase of the qualifying french fry that is available to schools. Fruit tells a different story, with more than half the dollar spent within this category going to support processed products. Processed products within this category include juice, cider, applesauce, and fruit slushies. In this next block of slides, we will drill down into each product category, starting with dairy. As you likely know, SFAs are required to offer eight ounces of fluid milk or milk substitute to students, and New York is a top producer of fluid milk, which usually, but not always, makes it an easy and affordable New York food product for SFAs to procure. As, as we've said a few times now, dairy was the product category that commanded the most dollars spent. All school food authorities purchased fluid milk with an average of 19.1% of all lunch purchases spent on fluid milk alone. Lastly, 25.3 to 65.9% of New York purchases were spent on fluid milk with a median of 578 
Drilling down further, the top three dairy items purchased were fluid milk, yogurt, and cheese sticks. Other items, as depicted by the yellow slice and the wheel, included sour cream and cottage cheese. For those SFAs that use cheese, these purchases average 10% of all New York lunch purchases. And lastly, nearly a quarter, that's 12 school food authorities, or 23% of them, qualified for the New York 30% initiative on dairy purchases alone, which was pretty staggering to see. For each of the product categories, with the exception of other items, you'll see these boxes. We present a myth we've anecdotally heard, we'll support it or refute it, and then provide some possible solutions. Just because we debunk a myth doesn't mean there's not a real challenge or problem to be mitigated behind the myth, because in every case, there are multiple challenges that need to be mitigated. So let's start with dairy. The myth is, I can't achieve the 30% without New York dairy. The fact is, based on our findings, you cannot achieve the 30% without New York dairy. Just because we validated the myth in this case, and spoiler alert, it's the only time we will, it doesn't mean there isn't a very real problem to be fixed. The problem is that not all regions have access to New York dairy, specifically fluid milk. And as we've said over and over again, a school food authority can or can't or has yet to reach the 30% without access to New York fluid milk. Some possible solutions include the strategic bid development in partnership with school food authorities and or cooperative bidding agencies, such as Office of General Services or BOCES. It could include the use of geographic preference on unflavored milk only. And we also think there's an opportunity to engage with dairy processors to sort out distribution and supply chain logistics because we know they play a, a role across the state. Important to note that a lot of folks are actively working on these solutions to try and increase regional access to New York dairy, again, specifically fluid milk. Whether or not these efforts prove fruitful remains to be seen, but we are hopeful. Next up is Cassandra to dig into proteins. Thank you, Cheryl. So next we look at the category of protein, where almost half a million dollars were spent on these products, making it the third largest New York category that we examine. For the non-school food service folks out there, I wanna note that protein is a required part of a standard reimbursable lunch. A majority, all but five SFAs, purchase local protein, but the range was large with anywhere from none to a third of an SFA's New York purchases going towards local protein. Next slide, please. When we look closer at the procurement data, we see that a vast majority or 94% of all protein products purchased were beef based. The top three purchases were hot dogs, burger patties, and ground beef. Overall, most of the protein purchases are what we deem to be raw or minimally processed and include products like ground beef, burger patties, chicken products, beans, and eggs. Next slide, please. We were also curious to look at the costs of various local protein because we know that many products are much more expensive than non-local products. Here are a few of the prices per two ounce serving of New York protein. For the chicken and ground beef products, this price is for the raw product. And we do want to acknowledge that there will be shrinkage during the cooking process. So take all of this with a grain of salt but the range was anywhere from over 70 cents per serving of beef to the high 30s per chicken. I wanna note that not all SFAs have access to chicken and it was mainly Broom Tioga related schools that served New York chicken products. However, the cheaper local protein options were tofu and dry beans, which were purchased at half the price of many New York beef products. Beans can also be served as a New York vegetable, but we included them in the protein category in this report. Next slide, please. Food service directors were asked to list all of their challenges, which the bar graph uh, here illustrates. You'll note that with animal-based proteins, the top two most cited challenges were cost, and I can't justify spending new school food dollars when I can use my entitlement dollars for the product. They were then asked to find their single biggest challenge, 
um, at which cost rose to the top. When we asked the same question for dried beans, student acceptability and not enough capacity to prepare them were cited um, most frequently. And when we drilled down to the single biggest, it was student acceptability. I do wanna be clear that SFAs must offer beans at least once per week as a vegetable. So students should be familiar with beans in some format during lunch and should accept them. Next slide, please. The myth we identified that related to meat-based protein is that SFAs are worried they cannot achieve the New York 30% without local protein. I actually thought this at first as well, but as we see, there were five SFAs that did not purchase meat-based protein whatsoever. I believe they did purchase a lot of cheese, however, and that served as a protein alternative for them. The problem that we see with meat-based protein is that it is more expensive for SFAs to menu. Another is that some schools are nervous about cooking raw meat in the cafeteria. Potential solutions that some food service directors found are to menu expensive local beef as a special event, like a monthly New York Thursday. Other food service directors diverted their entitlement or government commodity dollars to foods they could not buy locally. This way they could purchase more beef. Some SFAs are actually mixing local beef and non-local beef in meals to cut those costs. Okay, so next I'm going to let Becky share more about fruits and vegetables. Thank you, Cassandra. So now we're going to talk about fruit. Um, in this category, schools spend just over $1 million. School food authorities are required to offer each student in grades K through eight, a half a cup of fruit per day, and students in grades nine through 12 are required to be offered one cup of fruit per day. All school, school food authorities purchased some New York fruit products and 69% of SFAs spent more than 15% of their New York food product um, purchases on local fruit. Next slide, please. So juice, apples, and grape juice slushies were the top three products purchased in the fruit category. 51% of fruit purchases were processed, with grape juice being the most purchased item in this category. 48 of the 52 reporting SFAs purchased juice. 43% of fruit purchases were whole apples or apple slices with 50 of the 52 reporting SFAs purchasing Apple products. The chart here on the right demonstrates how fruit purchases heavily supported New York's apple and grape industries. Next slide, please. A common myth we've heard about fruit is that local fruit is too expensive. The fact is that there are actually affordable options and there are several strategies SFAs can use. Some problems regarding fruit are that many SFAs serve minimally processed fruit, which can be expensive to source locally. For example, SFAs can get cupped or canned fruit through USDA foods. SFAs can get locally available fresh fruit options through favors or the pilot program. Two USDA entitlement programs we'll talk a bit more about later. And they can get these foods using their entitlement funds. Also, the harvest season doesn't align with the school year. Some solutions to these problems are that schools could focus on procuring more local produce when it's in season and cost comparable to non-New York produce and purchase more non-New York produce um, or purchase less non-New York produce during this time. We also refer to this practice as front loading the school year with local purchases. Examples of affordable produce we didn't see a whole lot of and we know are highly available in the beginning of the school year in September include watermelon and cantaloupe. Um, schools can also contract or purchase directly from Apple producers to get the best prices and avoid distributor markups. And finally, when there's capacity, SFAs can freeze fruit in the summer for year round use. Blueberries are an easy to freeze and reuse option. Next slide, please. 
Next, we'll discuss vegetables. In this category, schools spent just over $450,000. SFAs are required to offer each student in grades K through eight, three quarters of a cup of vegetables each day. And students in grades nine through 12 are offered one cup of fruits and vegetables per day. Also, just a note, um, students must take a fruit or a vegetable for a meal to be reimbursable. All SFAs that qualified purchased vegetables, but there wasn't a specific vegetable variety that was purchased by all SFAs. 81% of SFAs spent less than 10% of their New York purchases on vegetables. Next slide. The top three vegetables purchased were lettuce or greens and kale. We included those all um, as one category, followed by French fries and then corn. 87% of purchases were on fresh or minimally processed vegetables. But 12% of vegetable purchases, this was um, just under $50,000 were processed. And the processed vegetable category consisted of one food, French fries. Four of the five categories that are required to be served by schools are represented in this chart on the right, which includes the vegetable subgroups. Please note that we included beans and legumes as a protein, as previously mentioned, so they're not represented here. But you'll see that dark green vegetables other vegetables and starchy vegetables were the most purchased and served um, sub vegetable subgroups. Next slide, please. Now we'll talk about the challenges to using more New York produce. We asked food service directors about their challenges, which you can see here. When we asked them to indicate their single biggest challenge, the seasonal nature of produce rose to the top. Next slide, please. So a common myth that we have heard about vegetables is that that seasonal nature of vegetables makes them really hard to menu year round. But in fact, in New York State, there are several varieties of crops that are available most of the year. So one problem is that some traditionally served vegetables are only available from local farms for a short time. Examples of vegetables that are commonly served include lettuce, broccoli, baby carrots, and cucumbers. Thankfully, there are several solutions. SFAs can serve local produce frequently in the fall when it's abundant and affordable. So again, here we see front-loading the year with vegetables as a strategy. In 2019, Buffalo Public Schools served fresh corn every week into October. They actually served corn through the first two weeks of October. There are plentiful varieties of vegetables available into November with season extension making conventionally grown greens widely available throughout this time. SFAs can also plan seasonal menus to include things like storage crops, root vegetables, and winter squash. They can use more New York potatoes, cabbage, and onions, which are available during most months, and dried beans, which are always available. The beauty of vegetables in New York is that the harvest season is pretty long, with new crops coming to harvest each month. So going back to seasonal menu planning, this highlights in-season crops, including these storage crops, potatoes, and cabbage, and onions, and also beans which are available widely throughout the year rather than relying on standardized menu cycles. And finally, as mentioned with fruit, schools can freeze or preserve produce in the summer if they have that capacity. Now I will hand it off to Cassandra to talk about New York grains. Thank you, Becky. So the fifth category is grain, which is the least purchased New York category. SFAs are required to offer a serving of grain for each reimbursable meal. However, only seven SFAs served New York grain products, amounting to about $50,000 total in the state over a one-year period. The SFA that purchased the most grain only purchased 2.3% of their school lunch budget with qualifying grain products. Next slide, please. 
When we take a closer look at qualifying grain products, we see that a large percentage, or 86% of purchases, were for pita chips. These New York grains come in cinnamon and plain. This was followed by a New York granola oat product and polenta, which is made from corn. Part of the reason why only seven SFAs purchased New York grain is because there were three grain manufacturers that we identified for school food service professionals. Next slide, please. This brings us to our myth about grains, where many food service directors would love to menu a local grain product um, that is not susceptible to seasonality or excess prep work, but there just aren't any products made with New York grain. And even if there are source identified products, they're too expensive for food service. We believe this is partially true, but one solution we see is that some SFAs are using New York flour, which some distributors already carry, and then making baked, good, baked goods from scratch with this ingredient. There's a group at Extension that is looking into building the food supply chain for New York grains, um, such that they're affordable for schools. So please stay tuned for this. Next slide, please. The final category we explored is our other item category. Here is where we placed uh, the non-itemized products mentioned earlier, as well as the ingredients or food items that do not qualify explicitly into one of the other categories. So they could have multiple components of a reimbursable lunch or just not qualify at all as part of a reimbursable meal. Only eight SFAs did not have any purchases in this category, but 35 SFAs spent 1% or less of their New York purchases on other items. Next slide, please. So when we look into the other item category, for the products that were indeed itemized, we see that the egg roll was the most purchased food product, followed by the New York potato chip and ice cream. So chips and ice cream can be served as part of a reimbursable meal as long as the SFA maintains its nutritional requirements. So sugar, salt, fat, et cetera, amounts for the week. One outlier in this category spent 15% of their New York purchases on other items and 14% of which was on ice cream. Another interesting trend of note is seen in the small number of SFAs who purchased local sweeteners like maple syrup and honey. Next slide, please. We asked the successful food service directors to list their challenges in purchasing more New York processed products. This includes other items as well as protein, grains, dairy, any processed item. I wanna mention that five food service directors representing 19 SFAs noted having no challenges at all. And I also wanna say that while dairy was lumped into this, as mentioned before, all the SFAs that qualified for the New York 30% initiative could access New York milk. So this answer would likely be very different in a region that didn't have access to New York milk, like in the Hudson Valley, Long Island, or other regions. That all being said, the single biggest challenge identified was the limitation of qualifying grain products. Next. Becky is going to share uh, more about strategic USDA food purchasing strategies. I'll start by talking a little bit about what USDA foods or entitlement are. School food authorities are in, awarded an entitlement for USDA foods based on the average daily participation in their lunch program. These entitlement funds can be used to get USDA foods, which are sometimes known as brown box or commodity foods, they can be used for diversion, which takes a whole product like a turkey and processes it into a more usable form like turkey taco meat. Or it can be used for DOD Fresh, also known as Favors, and the pilot program. For these two programs, Favors and Pilot, school food authorities can elect to use a portion of their entitlement um, through these programs. They can procure selected fresh produce from a few approved vendors throughout the state. New York purchases made using entitlement do not count toward the 30% initiative. So if an SFA gets New York apples through the pilot, these apples don't count towards their 30% purchases. Next slide, please. 
A common myth that we hear is that I can't purchase New York products because I get these foods with my entitlement. In fact, we saw that 68% of food service directors changed how they use their entitlement in order to be able to procure more local products. So some common problems are that many SFAs get USDA beef products and USDA cheese through USDA foods, and many, many schools get apples through favors or the pilot. So some solutions are to reduce the use of, use of USDA beef and USDA cheese to purchase New York beef and cheese. We actually saw that several districts completely stopped getting USDA beef or USDA cheese in order to just get New York beef and to increase their procurement of New York cheese products. Seasonality and front loading the school year comes into play when we consider favors or the pilot program. Um, a solution or a strategy schools could use would be to only use favors or the pilot to obtain non-New York produce or to use a lot of their actual school food budget to purchase New York produce when it's in season in September and into November, and then to save some of that pilot or favors in order to purchase produce in the colder winter months. SFAs can reduce their use of frozen or canned USDA fruit and vegetables in order to be able to purchase fresh, minimally processed or processed New York fruits and vegetables. And they could also shift the use of their entitlement to purchase more products for the breakfast program. So through the 30% initiative, only lunch purchases count um, towards the school's 30% New York purchases. So schools can use as much as they want of their entitlement during breakfast. Next slide, please. We asked qualifying um, the food service directors from qualifying SFAs why they pursued the 30% initiative. It's no surprise that the increased reimbursement rose to the top, but several food service directors provided specific detailed responses like, buying local is important and it does cost more, so the increased reimbursement is needed to continue the purchases. And it just makes sense to help out the farmers and be more USA, USA made. One director noted wanting to improve the perception of nutritional value. Another said personal desire. And a final said the state's commitment to the program. If we end up running emergency summer food service program again in the 21-22 school year, many schools that qualify again won't receive the funds. This could impact future years of our willingness to participate in the initiative. Next slide, please. The 30% initiative has directly impacted how schools purchase food and has resulted in the development of new products. So the 30% initiative has really driven change. Prior to the 30% initiative, school food authorities weren't purchasing any animal-based proteins. The amount spent on animal-based proteins rose to $487,622. Several of the beef products purchased were designed specifically for use in school meals. $45,455 went towards a pita chip that was specifically designed to qualify as a New York food product. And finally, the New York juice company, Grape Juice, was designed specifically for school food at a time when the New York grape juice or the New York grape industry was desperately in need of a new market. Next slide, please. Serving local foods also helped to change perception of school lunch programs. 74% of food service directors reported that participation in the lunch program sometimes increased when local foods were served, and 5% said it always increased. Only 16% didn't see an increase. This is significant because, as we noted before, reimbursement is based on average daily participation. And additionally, school lunches offer a balanced meal that many students might not otherwise have access to. Now I'm going to pass it off to Cheryl to talk about some of our farm to school resources. Great, thank you, Becky. So again, now we're gonna talk about some resources that are available to help you develop and or expand your farm to school program and where to find 30% eligible New York food products. First, we'll talk about farm to school coordinators. 
37 of the successful school food authorities worked with a farm to school coordinator. This map, which you've seen previously, displays this support spatially. The red circles depict the seven SFAs that were successful with the 30% initiative during the 1819 school year, the blue dots, the SFAs that were successful in the 1920 school year, and the green triangles denote a farm to school coordinator that worked with the, the successful SFAs. As you can see, there are clusters of successful SFAs highly concentrated around the presence of a farm to school coordinator, with the exception of the cluster in the south central part of the state. Here, you see the multitude of different support services farm to school coordinators provided to SFAs, from finding local products, to assistance with bid development, to favor New York food products, recipe development, taste tests, deciphering 30% New York initiative rules, regulations, and requirements, collecting the necessary paperwork for the 30% New York initiative, marketing and outreach, and agriculture, nutrition, and farm to school education. Of merit, 8.23 coordinators worked, supported, I'm sorry, 8.23 coordinators at an estimated cost of $453,000 supported 37 SFAs who cumulatively spent $4.3 million on New York food products in service of 85,000 students. So when looking at this loosely calculated return on investment, it is fairly staggering. Presently, there are 16 or so farm to school coordinators actively working across the state with additional hires being made. This map here on the right shows the presence of those coordinators. If you don't see a plus in your region or county, you can reach out to me and I'll provide my email at the end of this. Harvest New York has recently been uh, enabled through the support of the New York State Department of Ag and Markets to administer the New York Regional Farm to School Coordinator Program. And we essentially serve as a catch-all for anyone or any district or any region that needs assistance in farm to school support. Next up, I'm gonna talk about the 30% New York Eligible Product Database. This is a database that was created by Harvest New York, specifically Becky and myself. It lists products that qualify for the New York 30% initiative, and that includes dairy products, protein, processed products, and we very recently have added fresh produce and we continue to add uh, content to that particular section. It's important to note that it is product specific and when available, it includes the following information, distributors, distributor and manufacturer codes, vendor contact information, product formulation statements and other necessary documents and product sell sheets. Nearly all of the product formulation statements that we have in the database can be used by any school food authority that purchased the item in the 2020 2021 school year. All products listed are either New York grown and certified or contain at least 51% New York grown, raised or produced ingredients. And we have to have an approved product formulation statement for that product on file. The State Department of Education uses inclusion in the database as evidence of New York grown and certified. And we will be sure to share links to the database with all participants at the end of this session and in the chat box as well. The two database contacts include myself and Becky and you have our contact information there. And next up, I'm just gonna pull a screenshot of what the database looks like. You can see how the product information is laid out and the information provided on the other tabs, which includes, again, fresh produce, which is parsed out from the other products, a vendor contact list, a New York grown and certified master list. It's important to note that we upload that from the Excel file that we receive from Ag and Markets, and we do not alter it in any way. So just to wrap up, these are a few of our key takeaways. Of course, the value of dairy to a school food authority's ability to reach the 30%. We also noted that not all food sectors are benefiting to the same degree from this program, which suggests there is a lot of work to be done. There is no perfect pathway to the 30%. Success is realized by school food authorities that vary in size, geography, CEP status, again, that's community eligibility provision. Coordinator support is an essential ingredient for success. 
Aggregating orders proved to be an effective tool for school food authorities to reach order minimums. The 30% is driving positive behavior change and spending patterns. And lastly, we note the strategic use of USDA foods is beneficial, but it definitely takes advanced planning. That's the end of our formal presentation. Posted here is our contact information. Please feel free to reach out anytime with any question. Now we will open it up to informal questions and answers. Yeah, and, and I will, um, if anyone wants to unmute themselves to ask a question, you're free to do that. Um, I'm just gonna kind of scroll th through here. A lot of them have been answered ongoing. Um, yeah, Cheryl, maybe you wanna touch on this, but uh, Jennifer asks, why only 57 SFAs qualified for the New York 30% initiative? Um, they noted it seemed like a small number. So uh, Becky took a stab at it as well as me in the chat. I don't well, know I don't know what you guys that. said, so I may be repetitious. Um, I think it is important to note that it's the second year of doing this. Um, so the first year, again, we had seven. Second year, we had 57. It was a big jump. I do think that the State Department of Education um, came out with some really important guidance between year one and year two that helps school food directors be better prepared. Although of course 57 is still a small um, fraction of the 800 total districts out there. Um, I also think too, um, I've always said, I, at least in my opinion, this work is evolutionary. And so it takes time to be able to um, build up and really be able to respond to this opportunity and access to a farm to school coordinator has grown year after year and we know that they have been absolutely critical to being able to assist with, you know, if nothing else, and they do a lot more than this, finding local products, documenting local products, that is a really arduous task, on top, um, to, you know, to be put on a food service director who's busy, like, you know, making food and serving food to students and all of that stuff like that. So I don't know if I answered the exact same way that you and Becky answered, Cassandra, um, but I do think we'll continue to see this program go um, grow. Of course, COVID is through a huge wrench in that. So we have no idea what to expect um, based on the last school year in terms of schools that were able to qualify with all of the other challenges that were thrown upon them, um, you know, due to the pandemic. Yeah, just something else that I had added there was um, some actual product specific challenges. So access to New York dairy, um, some access to other New York products. So supply chain issues that, again, having some support there from a farm to school coordinator is really helpful. Um, but things like dairy are also things that we're really actively working on. Yeah, and I would just to reiterate there, I mean, that is a, a really important observation. We have the Hudson Valley, which is has huge population centers and all of Long Island that cannot access New York dairy. Um, and if you took nothing else away from this presentation, um, take away the fact that so far you cannot achieve 30% without New York dairy. Um, so again, it's leaving out huge, two huge regions with big population centers, large districts that have really been left out of this. Um, and as Becky said, there's a group of us really working on this um, and hopefully we can we can uh, furnish some solutions to that. Uh, one question that came up earlier, I think there were actually a few that were related to specifically bid processes. So we did go over a little bit um, the procurement methods that school food authorities used to get local products. So we had micro purchases, small purchases, um, geographic preference bid processes. And there were some questions about if there are bid templates out there. Um, there is not currently a bid template available, you know, at the New York State level with, for example, geographic preference language in there. And I would really encourage you to reach out to if you if there is a farm to school support um, coordinator or support person in your region, reach out to them. Um, or if not, I'll throw Cheryl out there since she has a lot of experience with this. Um, it's really helpful for us to work directly with a school food authority since each one is really different. Um, there can be different requirements for the district. Um, there are different desires about which products are to be procured. So please do reach out to us about that. We can help out. Yeah, and I would just add to that, Becky, um, and to whomever answered that great, or, uh, sorry, asked that great question. Um, we do have a repository, not a large one, but of sample bids out there that other 
Um, SFAs across the country have shared with us, other SFAs across New York State have shared with us um, that we've collected from our direct um, SFA partners. So there are models out there to look at. It's not a one size fits all, um, but there's at least some precedents that have been set. So again, just to reiterate Becky's point, reach out to your coordinator. If you don't have one, reach out to me and we'll get you the information that you need and share any resources that we can. So you're not starting from square one. There was also a question, um, is there a concurrent effort to help schools retool their kitchens to handle whole fresh produce in New York or product in New York? Um, Sam did mention that there's New York State Ag and Markets mm -hmm. grant that can help with this, but any other thoughts on sort of a concurrent effort? I don't know if there's concurrent, but I think the Ag and Markets grant is um, has very intentionally done that and I think effectively. So just a few examples, um, they provided funding to a school food authority in Western New York to help um, help them buy equipment so they can do some scratch cooking and they can also um, freeze products. And so that came directly from an Ag and Markets grant. Um, it helped them buy a cooler that they needed to store all that product once, once it, they froze it. I know other um, SFAs have been successful in getting a truck to help with distribution. So um, I think Broom Tioga is doing that. And I know there's an effort, I believe in Warren County to do that. Um, so that's the Ag and Markets grant. And then, of course, there are school food equipment grants as well. Um, and so not to uh, kind of um, hammer this point in, but if you if you do have a coordinator, that is something that they can help you do is write grants. At least um, our team of coordinators has done a lot of work, and I know that other ones across the state have as well, um, to help you try to get the equipment that you need, because we know that's a real challenge and being able to handle um, raw unprocessed fruits and vegetables, but also just to, you know, embark upon more scratch cooking, which a lot of our proteins right now are raw and it does require scratch cooking. Um, Beth Claypool had asked, she had said, I'm surprised that yogurt didn't play a bigger role. Any thoughts on that? Um, yogurt is, I will note that it's one of those products that for the districts that didn't itemize, it was lumped in with dairy. Um, so often, for example, we have a lot of schools in New York State that have their dairy contract with Upstate Farms, and they would just ask for a velocity report um, to get the information about what products they purchased. So it's kind of just lumped in there. Um, but yeah, that's a versatile product that can be served at lunch. That might be another one, though, that districts choose to serve just at breakfast so they don't have to deal with demonstrating how they separated out their breakfast and lunch costs. Yeah, I was gonna respond with that too, Becky, the parsing out. And um, for those that haven't been mired in the documentation for 30%, um, this initiative is specifically tied to lunch. So SFAs have to prove and separate out breakfast purchases from lunch purchases. And that's considerably hard with like a tub of yogurt, for example, they do it with milk because they have to. So one of the unintended consequences that we've seen from this initiative um, is that school food authorities have simply chose not to purchase New York items to, to menu New York items at breakfast and lunch. Um, and so that might be why we are not seeing it as much um, because it's too hard for them to be able to separate out. Um, but that's conjecture. Um, Colleen from Michigan noted that we have a competitive application process for the 10 cents program here in Michigan, which is another um, incentive program for schools to purchase more local products. Um, and she said that we also only had 57 districts of over 800 in the state participate in their third pilot year, just for context or comparison. So thank you for sharing that. And she also dropped some more information about that um, initiative in the chat. Um, I do know that there are a number of people who are from out of state, outside of New York State, um, on the call. So we, you know, kind of went through quickly what the 30% initiative is about, um, understanding that, you know, the majority of folks on the call are from New York State. So please do reach out to us if you would like to go into more detail on that, because we're certainly happy to talk about it. I want to add something to Deborah's question. Um, so the 30% additional reimbursement funds can also be used for equipment and other items like that. Mm -hmm. So I think part of that reimbursement was not just to offset the additional cost, but to help schools build that capacity. And again, it's the problem of like achieving the 30% in order to get the additional reimbursement. But once that is achieved, um, that can help help your school district.
Any other questions? I'm scrolling too at the same time to see if we missed any, but it looks like we got most of them. And these have been great questions too. So I think that we will for certain um, kind of write up our answers to them and send it out uh, to the list of registered attendees um, along with the PowerPoint and the recording once it's, once it's available. Um, um, oh, I, I see one. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, I just wanted to point out one thing that somebody brought up um, before in terms of the protein. So we had on there that the food service directors reported not purchasing any New York state protein prior to the 30% initiative. And this was as part of the survey. So, you know, the questions or the responses that we reported are what the food service directors reported. And in a few instances, um, those responses we anecdotally noted weren't necessarily accurate. So there were a few school food authorities who had actually purchased protein prior. There was um, one or two other questions that this did come up with. Um, so there are a few minor inconsistencies in there, um, but we're going with you know what the food service director said. There was one other question Karen had brought up since you had mm -hmm. permitting waivers for the 2020 21, 22 school year, do these qualifying, qualifying schools still receive the additional funding from New York State? I know that's still kind of being discussed and determined, but do you guys have any information that could put people at ease about that a little bit? I'm not comfortable answering that question yeah. personally. Um, I think we're still waiting for official guidance. Um, I will say signals seem to point that way, um, but that's where I'm going to leave it personally. <laughs> More to come there. <laughs> uh, the other thing too, I think Mo mentioned this and I'll just plug, um, we do a lot of information sharing across the PWT listserv. So that, for example, as soon as we get an answer for, on that, we will blast it out across the program work team. So if you are not signed up for the program work team and the name really sounds like there's work involved to be in the program work team, and there really isn't, it's just letting us know that you wanna be there and it gets you on that active listserv so we can share all of this information with you. Um, Mo, I can't remember if, if it was dropped in the chat box on how to do that, but there's a basically a form to fill out on the Farm to School website, and we'll get you signed up right away in, um, into the program work team. And, and again, access to all of the communication that we do um, through that listserv. I did drop the link in, so if you scroll up in the chat, you should find that. Okay, great. Yeah. It seems like I don't not see any more questions. Lots of thanks. Great job. You guys did an excellent job. Um, I mean, we are a little bit early, so we can kind of wait. If anybody else has some, some thoughts or questions pop into your mind, please ask them. Yeah, I would say that's the end of our formal. Um, we're welcome. We're happy to hang back and answer any questions if anyone has it. And again, you're welcome to take yourself off mute and ask the question yourself if you would like to. Yes, John, we will send out the slides. Absolutely. Um, and otherwise, you know, jump off if you're done and otherwise we'll hang back and answer any questions you might have. And I just want to note that there, there will be like a little bit of a delay in sending out the slides. We just need to make sure um, that they're accessible and everything like that. So you might see a little bit of a delay there. And we'll also share out the recorded presentation um, with everybody who registered. And you can feel free to share that, of course. And Cheryl and Becky, I'll just offer that if there are folks who are interested in joining in policy conversations, we're actively talking about program structure, um, and we're always communicating with agencies and lawmakers to talk about how to improve this program. So if anybody wants to get involved in that, um, I'll drop my email into the chat. Yeah, thank you, Samantha. So I'm so glad you plugged that because I actually meant to hit, hit you up for that. So for those of you who don't recognize your voice, that's Samantha Levy with American Farmland Trust and they spearhead the New York Grown Food for New York Kids Coalition. Um, absolutely critical to where we are today. So I do encourage you to sign up for that um, if you haven't. Again, I don't think there's a lot of active work involved in it unless you want there to be, but it really keeps you plugged into all the policy work that's happening across the state that's made all this good work possible. And we especially encourage folks who are from all over New York State to um, participate in those calls as well, because it's really great to get that perspective from different areas of the state since there is um, different need in different areas of the state. Yeah, and, and all that's really involved is sharing your experience. I know policy can feel kind of inaccessible or um, uh, like tough, tough to think through how one can engage, but really this, this program and improving this program is all about learning what's it like to experience it on the ground 
and um, how can we all work together to think of ideas that will be implementable to improve it. So it's really just sharing your experience is all it is. So I see that it's um, Orange County really needs support. I'm so excited to see that. We have a new coordinator. Um, Christy is here today with us. She might've already jumped off. Um, that just happened in the last few weeks. So we have two new coordinators in the Hudson Valley. Um, Christy Apostolitas, and I, I do hope I said her name right. I think that I did. Um, she's on our team now. And Katie Sheehan Lopez, and they will be working out of Ulster County and Rockland County, but supporting um, a multi-county region in the Hudson Valley. And Orange is definitely one of them. So I think Deborah will make sure that um, you have that contact information. Um, and again, we have a dedicated coordinator there in Hudson Valley. Thank you so much, Eigen Markets, for that support. How do you pay those coordinators? That's a really good question. Um, so funding for coordinators comes from multiple different um, funding sources, though the lion's share of it does come from the Farm to School grant that New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets administers. So that's a $1.5 million annual grant, and it's gone to fund many of the coordinators across New York State. Some of the other coordinators are funded through you know, federal, um, federal grant programs and stuff like that. But again, the lion's share comes through our state Ag and Markets program, um, and is that part of the state program funds? Um, yeah, so again, it's an it's a annual allocation of 1.5 that they direct to the New York State Farm to School Coordinator Program. It's grown over the years, so I think it started six or seven years ago with 350,000, and they have added to it, um, and now we're up to 1.5 million, and it's been critical to success. Okay, Christy, thank you for dropping your information in the chat box. Uh, Deborah, if you're still with us, um, you can pull Christy's information um, right from the chat box. And again, she is supporting Orange County. Yes, and I'm just going to read Samantha's comment because I really like it. This is a perfect example of our collective policy advocacy and action, recognizing that coordinators are critical. The department has made the choice to dedicate funds to those positions in particular. Um, and again, just to mention the New York Home Food for New York Kids Coalition, that was one of their policy asks for a handful of years. Um, so we have that coordinator support because our state agencies are supportive of this and because of our advocacy partners are lobbying for it. So it's definitely... Um, it's definitely, uh, um, it takes a village. I'll leave it there. Cheryl, can I just add that at the federal level, um, we worked with USDA and others to develop a, a value chain coordinator role, which is very similar, except it's not just specific to uh, institutional procurement. So that was a federal pilot and it was well-documented. And I think we're trying to get philanthropic funders to invest in that. And it's also a legitimate piece of your RFSP and your LFPP and your FMPP programs now. So. It's really great. I didn't know that you guys were doing this in New York, so it's really great to see this proof of concept so strong. Yeah, John, I'd love to talk offline about that pilot too. Um, so we see Becky here. Um, Becky's funded through, she's a regional farm to institution coordinator and she's funded through LFPP and that was a wonderful addition. Great. Um, what we are seeing in New York, uh, which is really encouraging, um, while our program is specific to schools, we are seeing other institutions slowly um, kind of ride the coattails of the success of schools. Um, and so I do hope that either as a state or in, you know, as, as uh, unique organizations that we start talking about farm to institution and not just farm to school because there's so many other opportunities through all those different agencies and institutional partners. All right, great, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Caitlin, I'm from uh, Newburg Schools. Hey Deb, um, and we're in Orange County, so, um, we're, yeah, we're happy about this, the new coordinator. Um, but the question I have, and I apologize if this was covered because I had to jump on late. Um, our, our breakfast program is huge. And I understand that we can't utilize any of the purchases under breakfast. But one of the things that I think makes me anxiety driven about this, you know, trying to achieve the 30% and, and putting the paperwork through is the task of separating out what we're using for breakfast versus for lunch. We use a, a huge amount of yogurt, a huge amount of milk within our breakfast program. And having to tease that out at 16 school buildings across the district is mind numbing to me. And I don't wanna take on separate SKUs because this is New York grown for lunch. And this is, you know, we're, we're just gonna use a different product for breakfast. That doesn't make any sense to me. So has there been any, um, I guess, 
thought of either including those purchases to breakfast in, in um, upcoming legislation, or is has there been a way that we found that it makes it easier to tease those purchases out? Samantha, I'm gonna... the... Oh yeah. Can I add to the report? Um, we, we've done a couple of evaluations or one evaluation per year of this program and um, put those out as reports. The first one was called Growing Opportunity for Farm to School and the second, Growing Resilience for Farm to School. Um, and those were both put out in 2020 and they can be found. I, I'm happy to share them with you if you wanna just shoot me an email. Um, but in both of those reports, we found, you know, similarly to, to Becky, Cassandra, and Cheryl's detailing of the barriers, including cost and other things, we found separating breakfast was one of the, or separating out lunch was one of the most significant barriers that schools faced in participating in this program. Understanding that the administrative capacity that that takes um, and all the logistics that that takes is really challenging. So um, we have been having very active conversations within our coalition about how to properly incorporate other school meals. Um, we've been having those conversations with agencies for a couple of years. They've been pretty responsive to those. Um, and we've been talking to lawmakers as well. So for the last few years, we have been building support for this. I think that it will end up costing a little bit more. So. Um, that is the key piece that we need to figure out is how much more will it cost and what does that really mean? Um, and there are a couple of other questions to figure out, but I just wanna let you know that this is probably the most active area that we are working on when it comes to policy in the upcoming year. And in, particularly, in, in particular, we're having some early conversations about whether or not we wanna to try to pass farm to school legislation next year to make this program permanent. And in doing so, we wanna make sure that we're getting the program right. And so um, that, that's a big piece of it. And I, again, I'll just, again, welcome anybody who would like to be a part of those conversations. You are more than welcome to help us advocate for that. We could always use your experience and voice um, or to contribute to policy conversations or just assign them to letters. Your um, desire to participate can be as large or as small as you like. Yeah, I will okay. note that um, out in Western Dr. New York. Just a second, please. Um, I, I, when I look at the map, or you have to turn your volume off. When I look at the map, it's clear that there are um, schools around the larger school districts like Buffalo that are getting the secondary and tertiary effects of their quantity of, of purchasing. Um, you have the two largest school districts on here from Orange County, Newburgh and, and Middletown, who are both CEP schools, who have both um, served over 4 million meals since the COVID outbreak, and we're not going to qualify for, for the New York State Initiative. So there's an inherent huge problem when, when we can produce the amount of food that we produce and reach the amount of people that we can reach, and we are not able to give them our own food. It's, it's, it's very upsetting because we have been, I have personally been trying to get the New York in Initiative since it started. And I, it's roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. Milk, OGS milk. Well, New York City took all the milk. They didn't leave any milk for the rest of the country. Um, then we had a small milk company come on board locally. Um, and one of us, thank you, Caitlin, took, held her nose and jumped in and took a chance that they could support a district her size. But the next one on board with that would be me, which could cripple her and me. So how do I do that? How do I not cripple her program, but start bringing my New York milk in from somewhere else? I think, Deborah, those are really good points, and we can't offer any solutions today on them, but I think the purpose, I mean, I think you are right. If you look at that map, they're definitely concentrated around larger districts, and we know that aggregating orders um, is critical to being able to get folks to really deliver and move New York food products east, west, north, south. So we are hoping as a part of this regional expansion. So like I mentioned, we've got um, Christy in Orange County um, supporting a tri-county region. Um, we've got Katie and um, Ulster supporting six or seven. There's support on the, in the capital region. We have support in North Country. We have support in Long Island um, that we can start working together as a system to drive 
um, demand for these products that actually can get these products to your regions more affordably. I don't think that's happened yet in a coordinated way. And so that's something that we are really hoping to do through this expanded program um, and, and hopefully solve some of those very real challenges that you put out. And um, Cheryl, I don't know if you can speak specifically to the work that's being done um, on dairy through folks at Cornell. So not just farm to school coordinators, um, but you know, partners at Cornell who are helping. Um, yeah, I mean, what they're really doing is getting us access to processors and really finding out what processors challenges are. Um, so we talk a lot about dairy. Um, we talk a lot with our friends in American Farmland Trust about dairy and all the folks that can't get dairy. Um, but really, we kind of need to go to the producers of, you know, the processors of dairy and find out what their real challenges are, what their roadblocks are, and how we can help mitigate them. And I can't say that we're going to be able to do it with certainty. I mean, I can't. Um, it's, but, but I can say that there are a lot of minds working on this. And, and again, we do have our friends in Dairy Foods Extension that are at least trying to help demystify it because dairy is really complicated. More so than I ever thought. I don't come from a dairy background. <laughs> I do think too, and I know we're kind of talking working group stuff here, but um, for our friends in the Hudson Valley, you know, Deborah and Caitlin and stuff like that, if we can, if there's a way that um, Christy and others can start meeting with groups of food service directors to really, again, try to move the system. Um, rising tide lifts all boats. That is an opportunity we would be really welcome to, um, to be able to get in front of the cohort of folks and, and really figure out um, what those shared challenges are. And again, try to approach it from a system solution. Middletown will host anytime, anywhere, any place. I have uh, the, the technology to be able to um, reach classrooms in China. So I think we can get enough people involved over here in, in, in Middletown. Um, and Chef would be happy to, pre to uh, prepare some of our fresh New York State vegetables for us to eat while we're, while we're meeting. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. We'll definitely take you up on that. This is great conversation. I hate to cut it off, but we are past the 2.30 mark. Um, so again, if there's any questions we haven't answered, um, drop them into the chat and we'll, we'll try to get circle back to those. Um, and certainly join the program work team to continue these conversations. These are great things that you can share with the listserv and the conversation can continue there. And also um, get with Samantha to get on the policy side of things too. So great, great presentation. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you all of you who have joined us. And again, we will be sending the recording out and the slides and, um, and thank you.